Good afternoon or evening or early morning, depending on where you are in the world. We are two protons in a cloud. As always, every week we bring you a live dialogue digging into some of our industry news affecting the developer community and chat with our guests of the week on a topic we want to know more about. I'm Adrian Kreft, one of your hosts and a technical evangelist for HPE Helion. Hi, and I'm Sujay Maishuri, your second host, and I'm a dev evangelist at HPE Helion. Welcome. We're on lucky episode 13, and it is our last before we come back to you in 2016. Our focus today, um, OpenStack lets you build a cloud by integrating several technologies. Flexibility, yes, uh, but sometimes it can be nothing short of bewildering. Uh, Alex Tesh and Anthony Reese let us behind the scenes into a real cloud built for a customer and give you an infrastructure's code example from the developer perspective. So they'll set the scene of the real world use case and give us a quick demo. So first, let's start off with uh, our new segment, uh, the last new segment, Sujay, of 2015. Yeah. So the Internet of Things is already a race between the big tech players for how to manage the data from an ever-growing number of connected devices. Now IBM announced its global headquarters for the Watson IoT business unit will be in Munich. Uh, this is actually a big commitment to the European market and a big move from a traditionally American-rooted company uh, trying to separate itself from the pack, I think. But we'll see if the strategic chess match move uh, gains the attention of enterprise-class customers dealing with big data and security concerns. Right. Uh, IBM also announced the availability of four new families of API services on the out IoT cloud platform for natural language uh, processing, machine learning, video and image analytics, and text analytics. Uh, Adrian, this week also marked the grand coronation event for the Cloud Foundry Foundation. The Cloud Foundry team based out of San Francisco here uh, in California brought together big name vendors who are all announcing their support for first of its kind as they call it, platform certification effort, uh, and to demonstrate Cloud Foundry is the global enterprise standard for cloud native application platforms. Yeah, this is big news, and they kind of had a, a secret PR meeting um, with a lot of analysts on Tuesday, so we're hoping more information uh, comes out throughout the week. But along with this certification track, HPE launched a technical preview of HPE Helion Cloud Foundry, which is their first look at their certified implementation of Cloud Foundry. Right. The Wall Street Journal revealed that Google's new CEO, Sundar Pichai, will make his first visit to meet with software developers and, and a lot of people as part of the company's goal to expand uh, reach to those users in emerging market. And when has they marked the review embargo after the LA premiere of Star Wars, The Force Awakens? The worldwide opening means I think the entire office is leaving early and geeking out. What do you think, Adrian? Is that true? I, I know our bosses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm not one to camp out in the cold and rain dressed like Darth Vader, but I'll drive by and feel bad for those of you who are. <laughs> so let's transition and bring on our guests for this week. Alex Tesh and Anthony Reese are cloud consultants for the HPE Cloud Group in our APJ region, hailing from Melbourne, Australia. So Alex, our go-to OpenStack guru, is currently evangelizing the HPE Helion cloud solutions uh, with a focus on the enterprise open source cloud portfolio. Uh, and Alex previously held positions with Red Hat and IBM. Anthony comes from a background in agile application development, and he has worked to support organizations in banking, finance, telecommunications, and technology, and of course does quite a bit of developer-centric side projects on his own. So welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, hey, guys. <laughs> Can you give us a quick overview of your roles and kind of what brought you to what you brought to show our audience today? 
All right. Well, at Brain, we work for the Cloud BU, what used to be the Helium Cloud BU, right? Now we are part of the HPE, but basically still doing the same role. We are basically two cloud consultants. I focus more on the open source side of the Helium portfolio, name uh, Helium OpenStack and Cloud Foundry, while Stanton is more aware, DevOps guru, right? Everything on Agile and DevOps goes to him. Yep, it's a pretty good summary, Alex. Um, so Alex and I work together quite a lot uh, for different organizations. Uh, at the moment, we're currently almost 100% for a large financial institution based uh, in Australia. And uh, they basically reached out to the two of us uh, to be able to help them for, as Alex was saying, really around the, the open, open stack side and the infrastructure uh, as a service piece. But they also wanted to take infrastructure as code and start to embed that into their DevOps and their Scale Agile framework. That's right. And I think that gives you basically the, the ground to, to basically start talking about infrastructure as a code. Today we have quite a few examples that we want to showcase. Uh, we're basically going to make use of heat orchestration templates. We call it HOT in short. And we're also going to combine some uh, API calls to Neutron to bring uh, into the virtual infrastructure load balancer as a server, firewall as a server. We have another very cool use case for VPN as a service as well. And uh, time depending, we could be looking into bare metal provision and using some Ansible playbooks that we have in place. Yeah, and the major problem that, um, that the organization really came to us with was, uh, was centered around, well, our they're transitioning towards the DevOps methodology and they're, they're doing quite a lot of Scrum, quite a lot of, and some of the groups are even doing Kanban as well, so which is good from a, from a pull methodology in Agile. Um, but where they were really struggling was, okay, so when they start to check in their code, um, how do they actually go about standing up environments and doing it via code, but also integrating it into uh, their security profiles and that was a major concern of theirs. And when we're going through, we'll also we'll tie that back to, to some of the concerns that they had, because uh, financial institutions traditionally um, have uh, obviously a lot at stake because uh, the security um, groups and the policies that they need to apply to the infrastructure that they're standing it up on um, needs to be uh, robust enough to be able to uh, protect the data uh, of their customers and also of the financial institution itself. And that's where we've really tried to tie it back to the as-a-service model for you know, securely-based um, load balances with pools, um, firewalls as a service, um, VPN as a service to be able to bring two clouds together and things like that. That's right. So moving right. forward, we'll be looking as well uh, into some integration with Nuage, which is a partner of ours, right? Uh, we call it HPDCN. And uh, DNS as a service is, is also in the works for our next POC with them. Lovely. So we, we always wanted to bring in a uh, guest uh, to talk on, you know, the security piece. Uh, I'm happy uh, we have you guys and, you know, we are looking more for 2016 next year. Thank you. Let's let's get started. Awesome. So like Anthony mentioned before, uh, basically we create different personas in this private cloud based on OpenStack, right? We have actually two different set of clouds running on this particular environment. Uh, we're going to run through the first use cases, basically just using one cloud. And once we hit the VPN as a service use case, we will basically get the two, talk, two clouds to, to talk to each other, which is quite an interesting case. All right, for the very first one, we have this particular tenant that we call QA, all right? And uh, we can see from the network topology that we actually don't have anything defined at the moment, all right? We only have the external network which is actually the network that the customer uses to communicate with the instances that we're going to provision. And uh, the customer basically always asks us a question about, okay, what is this thing about the infrastructure as a code, right? What is this manifest? How does it look like? So just to give an example, we have one uh, hot template hitting, uh, sitting here, which is basically based on YAML. And we have all the definition of the virtual infrastructure that we're going to build basically inside this template, right? From, from here we can see basically the networks that we will be creating, the subnets, we can see the router, the virtual router, we can see the servers. In this particular case, we will be building uh, two web servers, basically based on Tomcat, and we will be having a database backend based on Oracle Express Edition. And all of this is basically defined by code. 
right? So in Helion OpenStack, basically we have the capabilities as well to configure load balancer as a service and a firewall as a service and create auto scaling groups. So the auto scaling groups give you the capacity to basically monitor the resource utilization on the instances, name uh, CPU and memory, for example. And you can actually define thresholds. And based on these thresholds, you can uh, hit additional instances. You can spawn additional instances or terminate them depending on where you hit a higher threshold or lower threshold in, in terms of CPU utilization. All right, so in here in OpenStack 2.0, which is the release that we have at the moment, we are actually using a very cutting edge technology for the neutron components, right? We are using load balancing as a service version 2.0, which is actually not fully integrated yet with accelerometer uh, and with heat. So we had quite a few challenges with this particular customer in order to showcase the capabilities. So what we did is, as you can see in the in the template here, basically all the load balancer portion, the pools, the floating IPs, everything is commented out. And we basically just call out uh, another script after we build the, the infrastructure. And that script basically is using a Neutron API calls, right, to create the, the load balancer in a, in a script fashion and uh, bring the web servers as a members of this load balancer and as a floating IP. So with these two scripts, basically we are calling them from a main uh, uh, bash script that is going to stand up the infrastructure using heat and then use the Neutron APIs to basically build on top of that the load balancer as a service and, um, and add the web servers as members. So it's very straightforward. We just call it a uh, stand all, all right? So from here, we should be able to see in the Horizon portal how our virtual infrastructure basically starts to build up and in the real world, um, this would most likely be executed probably um, by Jenkins or um, so on code check-in, uh, that would basically kick off uh, a Jenkins build. Um, and then as part of that, it would go and kick off this particular script to go and stand up what, what was required for the applications to go and get put on top of. That's right. Right, so the database is coming up. Another of the questions that customers sometimes ask is, look, your instances are actually ephemeral. So that would mean that if for any reason uh, this particular instance gets terminated or somebody brings us down, then I'm going to lose all the data that is in on the ephemeral storage. So in this case, we don't want to do that because it's actually holding all the data files for this particular customer. Uh, so what we did is basically we made use of Silometer. In this case, we configure a three par as a backend for Silometer, and we create a LAN that we associate as part of the heat template to this particular instance, the database instance, and all the database is actually sitting here. So every time they spawn the infrastructure, Oracle is basically going to stand up, take a look at this LAN, where all the control files, read logs, and data files are, it's going to start up the database and roll forward to the last consistent state. Right, all of that is defined as code. So let's go back to the network topology. I think this one actually stand up pretty quickly. I, I have a question there now yep. for the database thing, right? Wouldn't that become a standard or shouldn't that be a standard, you know, for databases? There's no point of using an ephemeral storage, right? I mean, it, in, in, or in which scenario would you want that? Shouldn't that always be on, on a storage? Well, guys, in this particular case, uh, we are taking into consideration that the customer wants to bring into the cloud production databases, right, that have uh, real customer data. And uh, for them, it's very important and very critical to keep this data as safe as possible. So ephemeral storage would make sense for databases, for example, in development, perhaps, where you just want to quickly stand up an environment, uh, just load the database with some random data to conduct some quick tests. And basically, at the end of the day, you just bring it down. Then in that particular case, it would make sense. But in this particular case, uh, since we have actually production data inside, the customer is concerned, OK, what happens if my actual instance running the database comes down? It's as simple as spawning a new one. All right, just get a new one going and attach the loan, and you will get your, your database going again in no time. All right, so how does the stack actually look like? We could have actually created the stack from Horizon itself and uh, basically just point to the script and call it from here. 
and uh, this is the stack definition. Okay, it looks a bit nasty. It could be perceived as a bit complex, perhaps. But the thing is that it's actually very easy to troubleshoot from here because as long as all the components are green, that means that we don't have any issue, and, and the stack is actually created. The, the, the was created fully successfully, right? The moment that we have any component on red, uh, that would mean that we have a problem. And just by knowing what is a component that gave the issue, we can easily troubleshoot where it was an OVA compute that went wrong or whether that was an issue with the network. So it's very easy to actually see it from here. Let's take a look again at the script to see how is it going. I think that it actually finished already. Let me scroll up a bit. So from here we can see that after the hit stack was created, basically we proceeded to create the load balancer at our uh, server sitting on the DM set as members, and at the very end, we assign a floating IP. Okay, so this floating IP is actually the one that the customer can use to hit the web servers from the external network. We create another script, we call it test load balancer, and it's nothing more than just a core script, which basically keeps hitting the load balancer on the floating IP. And uh, this one is just to showcase that the load balancer basically is configured in a round robin fashion. So you can see that the traffic is going to web two, then back to web one, then goes back again to web two, all right? So this is a pretty cool one. Um, let's yeah, let's give it a try to the scale up. We have two different ways of doing scaling up. One is what we call a proactive Practice scale up, which is basically configuring a scaling up script, which is the one that we have in place today. And uh, this script can be either put on the cron or it can be put on CSA and OO. And basically, the customer knows when they are expecting this particular load to increase, and then they can prepare for it. So let's say uh, a Friday, 5 p.m., we know that the web servers are going to be critically hit with some additional load. So we will need to prepare one additional web server at 5 o'clock. All right, so that's when we can actually make use of this particular script that we call scale up. And once we run it, it's, it's basically just going to do some Nova API calls to our OpenStack environment. And it's going to start to stand up a new instance that we will call it scale web. All right, it's coming up at the moment. And then once it's sorted out, it'll add it to the pool within the load balancer as well. And you'll see that come up in Alex's script when he starts to run that. That's right. So actually, we can give it a crack at the script again. Just leave it running for a while. Oh, this one is a zero. And there was two. There was two particular use cases that the customer was interested in with scaling up and scaling down. Scaling down. Um, so one was a proactive scale up because uh, with many of the applications, they know exactly when. Uh, they require more resource uh, for it. So they know that between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., uh, they need to scale up many of their applications. But some of their other applications were a little bit more complex, um, and so that's when they basically uh, are tying it to monitoring that they've already got um, active within those environments. And then based on uh, monitoring the, uh, the usage and the response times of the application, um, they then fire off scripts to go and scale up and um, also scale down when it's not required anymore, especially on weekends uh, and things like that when they've got less load on the systems. So the good news is that uh, starting with Helion OpenStack 2.1, which is going to be released in January, February perhaps, by latest, uh, we are going to integrate Monasca with uh, Heat and with Load Balancer as a service version 2. And then basically all the reactive auto scaling will be possible. So basically we will monitor live all the instances that are running, and once we hit the CPU threshold, it will bring up and just spawn a new database instance. All right. So from here we can actually see that we added this new web server as a member in the load balancer. So let's give it a crack at the script that tests the load, and we should be able to see the third server, Scale Web One. Okay, so now the load is actually distributed between the three of them. The reason why we're using scripts and we're not actually using the web front end to show the application running um, is because, like we were saying before, we've built all of this for a customer, and the front ends do have um, customer information and customer logos all over it. So um, obviously for uh, 
for privacy sake, we've, um, we've needed to uh, take right. it away. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, this is pretty interesting. The the proactive scaling piece which you are showing, uh, will this also get contributed somewhere down the line upstream? Like, will the platform itself, OpenStack, uh, you know, will be intelligent enough to look at the traffic and do the proactive scaling upfront? Is that possibility? Well, the proactive one is something that is actually triggered by by some kind of event that the user knows is going to happen. So in this right. particular, we're giving Chrome as an example. So you already know that your lower is going to pick up at 5 o'clock. Right. So you just put this particular script into your Chrome. It's just a Chrome job or a blinking. Yep, yep. I understand that. But I'm, I'm saying, will the system later on become intelligent, saying that I know that on weekends or a Friday, as you say, uh, the load increases and earlier I used to do reactive scaling, but let me get into proactive kind of scaling. Will will that be a possibility, you think? I'm, I'm just curious to know that piece. It's, I mean, logically, it's already available. Um, we've already tied it to, uh, to monitoring services. Uh, okay. And um, so I think your question, um, Sujay, was really around, well, can it be done internally within OpenStack? And right. yeah, the answer is yes, um, it's coming. Um, and that's where it's on Asuka. That's Lovely. right. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so in the past, there were a few complaints from customers saying that Silometer was not fast enough to detect the load increases, and it actually took some time to basically scale up the environment. So that's why this time we are trying to bring Monask into place, which is going to be a lot smarter approach. So we are leaving Silometer just to dealing with uh, measuring the metrics for billing purposes, and Monask is actually going to take care of the auto scaling part, which I think is a better approach. All right, let's go to the next one. What I will do right now is this IP address that we have here is the floating IP assigned to the load balancer. So if we get tr try to ping it, we are actually able to do so, right? Which is perhaps not the ideal case. We can actually have some kind of denial, denial of service attack if, if we expose this externally. So in OpenStack, we also have what we call firewall as a service. In this particular environment, we don't have any firewall definition yet. And uh, what we did for this customer was basically create a firewall with code as well. So infrastructure as a code, we apply it to the firewall component. Let's run this particular script that we have here. And we will see that basically just using Neutron API calls, we are creating the rules to allow the traffic to AT80, deny all the traffic related to ICMP. We are creating a policy associating these two rules to that policy. And uh, lastly, we just create a firewall and uh, put the policy inside the firewall. Let's refresh our horizon. And uh, from here, basically, we can see the rules that we created. Right? We are allowing our web service. We are denying anything related to the CMP. We have one firewall policy holding the two rules. And uh, finally, our, uh, our firewall is actually there. All right, let's give it a crack to the ping again. OK, we cannot ping the load balancer anymore. But if you run your script um, to uh, to actually see whether you can hit web 1, web 2 on the, on the load balancer because it's running on 8080, it yep. should work because we've allowed 8080, but we've denied port 80, which you just tested with the ping. That's right. So let's try again our little script. And this will work. We got our rules right, and we did, which is good. So we've denied we've denied um, any attacks coming directly in on a ping for port 80. Um, so we're denying all of that, but we're still allowing um, the actual application, which is hosted on 8080, um, of Apache to still be able to respond. That's right, which is good. OK, so the next one, which is the coolest use case, and I think this is the first time that we are going to demonstrate it, because we always run out of time with the customer every time that we hit load balancer as a service. And this is actually a bit of a mind-blowing use case, right? So I'm going to bring over our second cloud. It's, an exactly, it's exactly the same OpenStack cloud as the first one, but it's basically sitting on a different environment. So you can think of this different environment as perhaps a cloud that is sitting on a different data center very far away from the production one, or perhaps it could be even the public cloud. So one, so one, one potentially running in um, San Francisco and the other one running in New York, for yep. example. And you want to bring the two of them together to be able to talk. 
securely. Right. Securely. securely. Yeah, very important. <laughs> so let's take a look at the network topology for our second cloud. We are going to have our web services running on this side. So I have a web server here. I have a Ubuntu client, which is basically going to load the browser later on to make sure that the web server can actually hit the database. And uh, let me log out of this particular QA tenant that we have here, and I am going to log in as our VPN tenant. And on this cloud, we already have stand up the infrastructure just with the database. Okay, so as you can see from here, um, actually our instances, they don't have any floating IP associated, all right? So the only thing that we have is the tenant IP network. On this side, the only IP that we have should be the tenant as well for the web server. So at this moment, there is no way that, uh, okay, we have floating IP only for the Ubuntu instance, all right? Because I am going to log in into Ubuntu to actually access the web database, which in return is going to talk to our database server. Let's try something. Uh, let's try to log in to the database using the console. So just while you're doing that, Alex, um, this use case was really interesting to the financial organization um, that we were working for because they have databases and they have web servers, but they're not always are within the same clouds, if that makes sense. So uh, they have a number of private clouds, but they also utilize public cloud as well. And they wanted to have um, available to them uh, the ability to have databases in one cloud, web servers that can access different databases in other clouds, but do that securely. And that's where the VPN as a service example came in, so that they can, they can get from one cloud to another securely to get the data that they require for the front end. That's right. All right, let's take a look at this. Right now I am on the database server on our first cloud. I am trying to ping our web server on the second cloud. As I said before, uh, we just have the float, the, the tenant IP on this particular web server. There is no way that I can hear it from the database. Now from Horizon, actually, we should be able to see if we have a tunnel configure, which we do on this side, okay? I already created the IPsec connection from uh, the second cloud. What we have lacking is the VPN configuration on the first cloud. If we go to our VPN in Horizon, I basically don't see anything. So what I will do now is, again, using code, we are going to create a definition for this IPsec tunnel. And uh, we should be able to ping the web server from, from our database server. Let me see, we should be here. Let's create a VPN. Now you could have you could have created everything um, from scratch using scripts um, as code, uh, but we've we've chosen um, to save a little bit of time uh, to just create one section of it. But you can just as easily kick the whole thing off by code script. Right. Hey, just give me a few seconds, guys. Lot of times. Yeah, luckily we never run it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Right. So the other thing that's interesting about this use case too um, is that uh, the financial institute, institution in question was also interested in doing this from um, from AWS through to um, OpenStack. So that's where, where the original use case came from. Um, and on top of that, they also had, um, had a situation where many times they would deploy applications into uh, a virtualized environment but they also wanted to be able to take that and then turn it into um, physical deployment too. So they literally wanted to be able to utilize uh, one template to be able to, to deploy um, virtually or within a cloud type environment. 
but also be able to do the same thing and be able to deploy it physically as well. So we've also created a use case where we can deploy an application uh, on OpenStack um, utilizing an, an image-based solution um, virtually, uh, but we can also replicate exactly the same deployment and use uh, templates um, and uh, physically provision uh, physical servers and deploy it in a physical world um, as well. So exactly the same code base, uh, exactly the same example, but one deployed virtually and the other one deployed as a physical um, instance So when they require more high performance compute or things like that. So that example is really tied around um, HPC. That's right. All right, we are good to go. I think uh, this is our first cloud again. So basically, I didn't load the environment previously. We just load the environment here, and uh, we were able to actually stand up the VPN tunnel by code on this first cloud, right? So we can see here the IPsec tunnel is already created. We can see it from Horizon. Let's go back to our web server, and uh, let's try to give it a crack. OK, we can ping, actually, the web server right now, which is sitting on a different cloud in a totally different environment with no floating IP. All right, let's try the more cool use case. Let's try to change user to, to our uh, Oracle user. And uh, let's just take a quick look to the database. All right. There are quite a few tables that we have here. Uh, let's just query quickly this table called SON. Right, we have quite a number of, of records inside the table. Uh, what I will do is let me open a browser from the Ubuntu client sitting on the second cloud. It's actually this one. Let's just open a console from here. Or actually, I think I have a session running. Yeah, we have an SSH session here. I created this script, which is basically just calling a CLI browser. All right, we have links installed on the machine. Links is basically a command line browser, so we don't have to use uh, Chrome or Mozilla. I just run this particular script, and we will try to hit our web server, which in return is going to hit the database. So in this particular case, we have a frame environment configured on Tomcat. I will hit the very first frame, which is the one holding the database. And if everything goes right, we should be able to see the sounds that I showed you previously coming from the database. Right, so the communication is actually taking place. So like Anthony mentioned before, this could be sitting on a separate data center. The web server could even be sitting on a public cloud and you can keep your data secure in your premises, right, or in on a private cloud, and you just configure this VPN to it across, and you should be able to hit it, which is pretty cool. Um, so probably finally, do you want to just sh um, show the theory behind uh, bare metal provisioning? All right, yeah. Let's then, take um, a look into that one. We won't run the whole thing because it takes far too long, and everyone would literally fall asleep, including myself. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let me see what would be the best way to show this one. OK, we have in the second cloud, at the moment, we only have one compute node. And uh, we have one controller, right? And the whole idea is to basically allocate it uh, uh, as demand is required additional compute nodes inside this second cloud. And the way to do it is with HLM, which is one of the value add that we have with Helium OpenStack 2.0. So basically, we have a full set of playbooks in place that leverage on Ansible to basically bring additional servers into the cloud. And we can actually could make use of Ansible as well to provision a virtual infrastructure. There are modules in place for Ansible that uh, allow you to spawn instances into the cloud or create a network, so it's attached storage. So it's actually quite a flexible approach. So we were telling this particular bank that infrastructure as code is not only limited to heat orchestration templates. We could be looking into Ansible as well, or Puppet in their case, since they are quite familiar with Puppet, right? So let's take a look at case number four. It's the one that we call, which is basically just calling one of the playbooks that we have. And this playbook is basically just bringing in a new compute node inside our cloud. This is way to see it, at least to see how this one starts. Uh, 
provision in the bare metal machine is from, from our ILO. Let me try to quickly connect. And because this, this uh, financial institution is a full, full grade enterprise customer, um, they, were, they were very, very concerned from an operations perspective. Um, on being able to maintain and to easily expand uh, their cloud environment, i.e. at the hypervisor level for private clouds. So this example for them uh, was critical because uh, they're adding um, a bunch of servers every week uh, to expand their environments. That's how quickly they're growing. Um, so it's, it's roughly about between five and seven uh, servers every week. And they wanted to have an automated way to be able to do this. And this example shows them that it can be done to be able to expand their resource pool to be able to add physical servers um, into that hypervisor pool. That's right. So this is our ILO. So basically what the playbook is going to do is it's going to use IPMI calls to basically power on the machine. All right. So right now there is a sleep condition running here in which is basically waiting for four minutes to make sure that the server is powered off. Since the server is already powered off, what I will do is I will just tell our playbook to continue. So we should be able to see how you the playbook. Wait four minutes. Yep. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you will need to wait for three minutes. What? Yeah, because what it's doing at the moment is actually going to use this uh, IPML tools utility that we have on the HLM node to basically trigger the starting of the server using this particular playbook. So we should be able to see it coming up now. All right, so now this is the portion that is going to take a while because we have quite a number of interfaces in the server, six to be precise. And uh, our uh, interface configured for Pixie Boot is actually one of the 10 gigabit interfaces, which is the number five. So it's going to probe each of these interfaces for Pixie until it hits the number fifth. And then after that, it will actually start to inject all the binaries from Kobler. We have Kobler running on HLM. And uh, after that is done, then basically we can go ahead and run the next playbook to add the machine, which is fully configured with HP Linux into our OpenStack environment as a Nova Compute node. So it's quite a cool use case, but it takes very long time to showcase. It does, but it's automated, so it doesn't matter. You can just run in the background while we chat. Cool. cool. Awesome. So any questions? Wow. I mean, uh, of course, I, I'm sure uh, our audience has questions and they would want to know more. Uh, but this was very, very good. I, I learned a lot of things uh, today. So Thank did you. I. And this is not something that I can tell you I have a good background in. And OpenStack, to me, is very bewildering and and even at the meetups you guys are very very active in the meetup community and what are some of have you guys presented this before in, in that setting well in the last meetup we did infrastructure as code as well but we took a slightly different approach so we didn't want to show the traditional heat orchestration templates that everybody runs on OpenStack we were trying to focus more on uh, what we have on HLM which is not quite there on the upper, other OpenStack distros. And uh, we basically showcase to that audience how to provision instances, not only on private cloud, OpenStack clouds, but also in our HP public cloud, which was still available at the moment, right? Yeah. So basically using the Ansible playbook, we were able to provision privately also on the public cloud with the same playbook. And then we install binaries on both of them, and we managed to get them to talk across all using a single playbook, which was quite an interesting case. Yeah. And we tried to do the same demos twice, so just to keep it interesting. Yeah, just in case that the same people show again and again. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> now, where can we go for, for more information? I mean, this obviously, it's a customer use case, so it, it's not publicly available. But is there a way that we can get started? Um, especially you have for a blog, a GitHub, or any any other resource for our audience? Uh, not really GitHub. Actually, we have pretty cool documentation in uh, docs.hpcloud.com. So actually, all the API calls that you need to get uh, firewall as a service and load balancer as a service going are actually there. So you can go and take a look to this website. And basically, uh, scripting that is as simple as just understanding the commands that they are presenting to you. 
and just creating your own script. Pass the parameters and it pretty much works. Right, right, right. Cool, lovely. This was this was really good. Thank you for the demo. Uh, we we know a lot of people get scared kind of thing of demos because demos are meant to go wrong. Uh, but uh, but this was very good. It it all worked out very well. Yeah, well, I was a bit concerned with the thirteen episode, but yeah, yeah it was exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are obviously running out of time here. Um, we want to thank you guys for taking the time to chat with us today. And we will hopefully be able to route any questions um, that our audience may have. Um, so those will come to us and we'll pass them on to you and hopefully uh, we'll continue the conversations in the new year. Awesome, sounds great. Thank you. So uh, folks, remember to follow us at uh, our, our at our Twitter uh, feed, it's two protons, number two protons, and you can see it at, at Adrian's back. She has written it uh, on the whiteboard there. Uh, so we'll keep you in the loop. See you all in 2016 when we are back with new episodes and guests from all things cloud. Thank you very much for supporting us in 2015 and and. And we'll and miss lucky you episode the... 13. So yeah. thank you, Anthony and Alex. We'll see you guys soon, okay? Thank you. Bye. Bye.